You're listening to Keeping It Real with Janine, your guide to living an authentic, healthy life. I'm Janine, and it is my hope that through these podcast conversations, you will be inspired in some way to be more of your best self. Every two weeks, I have an inspiring conversation with an ordinary person leading an extraordinary life. And today, Dr. Jose Rodriguez is returning to the podcast. He has a TED Talk now entitled, The Power of Solidarity in the Moments of Life. Dr. Jose Rodriguez is a professor of communication studies at Cal State Long Beach. He collaborates with clients to develop and deliver messages that work. As a communication scientist, he has helped over 10,000 people and numerous organizations achieve major milestones by focusing on how messages function to create desirable results. Jose holds a doctorate in communication and is a recognized expert in message development, presentation delivery, and audience involvement. Welcome back, Jose. How are you? Oh, fantastic to be with you. Thanks so much for that wonderful intro. Where did you get it? (laughs) (laughs) You wrote it. (laughs) That shows you that I have an intuitive grasp of the obvious. (laughs) Always a good thing. Uh, (laughs) So I think this is exciting. So I've been curious as to how one actually comes about doing a TED Talk. Uh, you know, not everybody gets to do a TED Talk. So how did this how did this evolve for you? How did you get this opportunity? It is a very interesting story, but actually also very, very simple because I I stumbled into it, right? It wasn't by grand design. It was just <laughs> uh, a rather... <laughs> <laughs> kind of in the flow. Yeah. yeah, right, right. You know, you you understand about these dynamics. So anyways, um about oh, maybe about 2 years ago, uh the director of public knowledge on campus uh asked me, you know, to to do one because they host one on campus every year mm-hmm. and she knew that the call for speakers was going to be uh coming out pretty soon. So she said, hey, why don't you apply? And at, at the beginning, I thought, well, you know, I don't know if I want to do this. It kind of sounds like, I don't know, like a lot of work or <laughs> it sounds like something that maybe I don't necessarily want to do or that I don't have time for or whatever. It was some type of thought of that form. And then the the deadline came up and and she encouraged me again. And I thought, well, let me just throw my hat in the ring. But, you know, I didn't have uh, a video. I didn't have a way of producing an audition video, and mm-hmm. so I was I was struggling with that because that's part of the process. You have to produce an audition video that lasts maybe about a minute or two and say something about your talk. And at that point, I had no idea what I would even talk about. <laughs> so how the heck am I going to? talk about what I'm going to talk about when I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So it was, it was rather bizarre. So I called a friend of mine who's a a visual artist and he was very kind and said, Hey, come on over and we'll, we'll shoot your, your promo, your, you know, your, your audition. I go, okay. So I rehearsed all the way to his house in my car (laughs) three or four times about whatever I came up with at the moment. And, and, you know, and I share these details because I want people to realize it wasn't that, oh my gosh, I'm a genius and I had it all figured out a priori. I was Mm -hmm. stumbling through it quite literally. And when I got to his house, uh, I was very fortunate that I I delivered the the promo message in about three takes. And and then we, we looked at it on video uh, I picked the one that I liked the best, and he helped me uh, uh, upload it to YouTube, and then we submitted the application, and that was the the beginning. And then I had to wait to see if they would even pick me, because you know it's it's a very competitive process. Uh, I think they usually get over 200 speakers applying for 10 to 12 slots. So it wow, was, I didn't it know was, that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was quite quite uh, a big thing to be selected. And again, I didn't know that uh, ahead of time. So that that's a little bit about the beginning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Wow. And then how did you pick your topic? Or did it pick you? <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> Thank you. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I was driving one day and I just had an inspiration. I, I had a moment where a thought just came. It was like a flow of ideas, and I had to just pull to the side of the road. I had a notebook next to me, and and this idea just came about about solidarity, about navigating truth, about uh, darkness and light. And there was these metaphors dancing in my head, right? And it was a little fuzzy, as you hear from this description, right? Mm -hmm. It was a little bit vague, and but I just wrote it down. I just let it flow. I didn't censor. I didn't get in the way. I just, I just let it. Uh, come out in the process of of writing, and that became the the core idea around uh, the talk. I didn't know about uh, the notion of solidarity uh, at the beginning. I didn't think that that would be the thing. In fact, I struggled quite a bit with the title. I, I didn't know what to call it for the longest time, and um, I went through about twenty two drafts of the manuscript. Wow, and and the preparation was eight eight months in the making. I I hired a coach. Uh, I hired um, a hypnotherapist, and I practiced every day in the car. I went to uh, our local kind of speech performance center on campus. It's called the Hoth Center, and they allowed me to kind of videotape myself and see myself on camera and uh you know get some feedback on on my performance so mm -hmm. that's that's a little bit about about the the preparation process um which was you know a, a, again not something that i had uh intended mm -hmm. to uh to create at the beginning right it was kind of a process of discovery a di uh, discovering not only not only the title but the ideas uh behind the talk Mm hmm. Wow. You I mean, you put a lot of effort into into creating this. And I have to say, I've watched it and I, your presence on stage is is excellent. You're you're animated. You're um, you know, not only do you want to listen to what you have to say, but it's fun to watch you. Oh, thank you. Oh, I really appreciate that. You, you, you've made my day. <laughs> and, you I'm know, before thinking... before we go on to the topic, I just want to say, because you're, you're, you said how this idea came to you in the car. And I find a lot of ideas come to me when I'm driving. And um, I, that's one of the ways I really like to use driving is, is ideas. And I've realized recently, because I came up with something the other day, and I was like, oh, I'm going to forget this. You know, I got to remember this. I got to remember this. And I think what I'm going to start doing is uh, setting my iPhone on voice record so that when I get an idea, I can just hit that button and just talk while I'm driving. That's an excellent um plan i think it's a it's a beautiful idea i think that you know setting a device on record or having a, a notebook you know so I, I my 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 crazy methodology was very old school right i had a notebook <laughs> right and a piece of uh you know a writing utensil as i like to say and i just pulled to the side of the road and let the content unfold and now i just carry a little notebook with me wherever I go, because ever since I had that experience, you know, those types of ideas are are coming uh, more and more. And just kind of having a pen and paper uh, available to kind of jot things down mm -hmm. has really helped, uh, you know, create, you know, a way of of navigating right the process of creativity in a way that's kind of fluid and fun and and entertaining you know it's a way of kind of entertaining yourself yeah but yeah. driving definitely is a place where those ideas come so you have to be very careful right <laughs> yeah yeah well i wonder if because your your mind is focused on you know on driving um on the the skill of driving that it must it must free up like your right brain or something to to flow or I, I don't really know how it works, but 
I know the the shower and driving are the two places I get most of my ideas. Right. That's good. <laughs> we should we should co-author a book, you know, The Wonder of Showering and Driving, right? <laughs> For creativity. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Okay, yeah. so let's talk about solidarity. So your TED Talk is The Power of Solidarity, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> The Power of Solidarity in the Moments of Life. So what does that mean? For me, it means uh, connecting with another human being mm. in a way that is meaningful in the moments of life. Uh, as I say in the talk, we've you know, developed a culture that has gone wild inventing insignificance. We discard people all the time. We don't notice people. We're mindless. We're just fixated with our phones, fixated with the latest technology, and we forget about the beauty of the human heart. We forget about the beauty in the moments of connection and really being present with another person having a conversation and allowing that moment to be a lived experience where we are engaged with each other, we're listening to each other, and we have a felt sense of being in communion with each other in those sacred moments of life. Mm -hmm. How do you mean we, when you said we discard people, I think that's how you said it. Um, how, how do you mean that? Well, I just think that um, if you, uh, in going through life, uh, you know, at least in my experience, and as I as I see people, um, you know, navigating their way through interactions, I think people are feeling unseen. People are feeling unheard. People are feeling unwitnessed, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a there's a growing sense of of isolation. Because people are navigating life through mediated means. Mm -hmm. That is, instead of having a rich conversation, which we used to have all the time, instead of meeting face to face, which we used to do all the time, instead of having an old school phone conversation, mm -hmm. which we used to have all the time, we tend to have life mediated through technology, through texting, through email, through, uh, you know, whatever device you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I think that that at times creates the experience of isolation. Mm -hmm. It creates a, 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 a felt sense that, you know, gosh, I'm, I'm connected with all these people or I have all these followers, but I feel alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think that a remedy for that is conversation, dialogue, interaction, uh, a felt sense that for me only really happens in the presence of another person who is acknowledging the uniqueness of you in the moment, right? In the power mm -hmm. of the moment, in the power of being present uh, with you, uh, speaking with you, like, you know, having a wonderful conversation with somebody when somebody is having a conversation with you and you're really in the flow and you go, gosh, that was such a great conversation. Oh my gosh. That just seemed to go in these very interesting directions. I feel hurt. You know, I'm sorry. I, I, I feel heard. Mm -hmm. I feel seen. I, I just feel very nourished. And that I think is what happens when we experience solidarity, moments of communion, moments of, of connectedness, connectedness. Uh, in, in the literature, in, in social psychology, we sometimes call that, uh, you know, intersubjectivity, where we feel that we are vibing with each other. On your show, you talk about it as being in the flow, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, being in the flow of conversation happens in the dynamic of you know, the exchange of messages between two people. And that tends to happen when we're live, when we're, you know, kind of just hanging out with each other and not so much when we're, you know, texting, let's say. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, to me, 
texting and messaging are, are great. They have their place, but it's not a conversation. It's not, it, it's just like when I'm having a conversation on this podcast with someone, I, I never know what direction um, the conversation is going to take a thread here, a thread there, and off it goes. But you can't, you can't do that with texting and messaging. Exactly. There's a, um... There's an invention that's happening. So you're speaking to the idea of invention. Right now, you and I are inventing this moment. We're mm -hmm. inventing this process. And we really don't quite know where it's going to go, which is exciting and beautiful and, 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 and creative and spontaneous. And there's this profound and sublime experience of freedom. Mm -hmm. When you participate in that flow and allow it to uh, take you, if you will, and then just kind of go with those beautiful parameters that seem to come into being uh, apparently out of nowhere. And that, I think, uh, helps to build a, a bond, a, a connection, a feeling of aliveness that we don't get when messages and conversation are happening via mediated means. And, you know, texting is one example. I think you gave a great, um, you know, uh, testament to the fact that texting is great and it has its place, but it's very limited in its ability to have us have a profound and embodied sense of empathy for one another. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and I just had this thought that I wonder, although... In some ways, maybe texting and messaging feels safer for some people. Although for me, I I don't find it so because you don't get any nuance, right? So oftentimes, I might message somebody a little something or email, and I'm taken totally uh, the wrong way. I'm like, how did that person get this from what I wrote? This isn't what I meant, you know, because we're all we're all filtering through our own experiences and perceptions. So you just you don't know how without a conversation, you don't know how what you're writing is being received. How you are being received. Brilliant. Brilliant. Exactly. That is a profound insight, right? You don't know how you're being received in the writing of a message because there really isn't a place for authentic feedback in the moment, right? Right. You send a message, yeah, right? You send a message and boom, the other person is free to interpret it however they want. You can't pause in the moment of transmission or in the delivery of the message to say, Hey, listen, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not what I meant. No, no. What I meant was this other thing. Mm -hmm. There isn't that richness of, of feedback in our exchange when we're, when we're texting, when we're writing, when we're sending an, uh, an email. Uh, sure, it's a way to send a message, but that process of getting feedback uh, is severely limited because we're not live in living color, as I like to say. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And I know there are times when I've been writing to somebody and we're going back and forth a little bit and I finally go, okay, I'm getting on the phone or you know, <laughs> it's time for a, a real conversation here. <laughs> right. That, that real conversation becomes really important. And sometimes you may even ask yourself, gosh, why didn't we just talk about this? That would have been a five minute conversation instead of whatever a half hour of emailing back and forth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I, I mean, you know, there's, we're, we're all spread out all over the world, right? And we have, I'm sure most people now have acquaintances or followers or quote unquote friends um, all over the world, which it doesn't make it um, easy to maybe to talk, especially with time differences and things like that. But there's got to be a balance. There has to, you know, people feel that, I don't know, that they have community on Facebook, but is it really community? Is it, is, does it really replace getting together at your local coffee shop and having a, a conversation face-to-face -face with some friends? 
Right. Face to face conversation has has its place. And, and I think that you make a valid point where, you know, if you have family members in other parts of the world, it's going to be very hard because of time differences to have uh, moments of solidarity through uh, conversation. And that makes you know perfect sense. And so, you know, Facebook and other types of mediated technologies allow us to stay in contact with people via long distance, which is great. That is an amazing function. And I think it becomes even more important when those technologies are available to make the time just to have this kind of a conversation. I mean, like the conversation we're having right now, it is mediated and it is via uh, kind of a mediated modality, but at the same time, there's that human interaction the aliveness and the, the creation of one point and then transitioning to another point that is building on a point that we just had at the beginning and we didn't know. And that process of creation is very rich and very difficult to replicate via the written word or via images on, you know, let's say Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it seems to me that balance somehow is the key here. Yes. Yeah, no? exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's um there's a way of talking about it uh, as a tool. I like using tool as a metaphor, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So, you know, a hammer is neither good nor bad. It just has a certain function, mm -hmm. right? A screwdriver is neither good nor bad. It just has a certain function, right? Mm -hmm. And I could go on and on. Uh, Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat, all of those are tools and they're neither good nor bad. It's just how we are using those tools, right? Mm -hmm. And I think conversation is a tool for developing a sense of solidarity, for creating stories, for creating you know profound embodied empathy. And that has a very central place in our well-being, I think, you know, in our history as a species, we, we're, we're storytellers mm. and we've been sitting around campfires for centuries, listening to stories and being moved by the power of stories and having people uh, talk about uh, culture and talk about tradition and talk about handing down to the next generation the wisdom from previous generation. And, and all of that usually happens through the power of story, through the power of, of conversation, through the power of exchange with other people. Mm -hmm. through, the, through the voice. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you, uh, that's a really good point I hadn't thought of, that the idea of storytelling and down through the ages, so much information has been passed from one generation to another through storytelling and you can't tell a story through messaging or texting it is very very difficult uh in my experience mm -hmm. and uh even though people try and you try to kind of whatever create a slideshow or create a deck or create images or create a page or create music um it it's it's great but there's something to be said for the power of spoken word, for the richness of language and how it is used in the voice. And then it hits you as an audience member. And then you get to participate in that dialogue with somebody else and create a moment of significance, a moment of communion, a moment of solidarity that just wasn't there before. And the magic of that is not only profound, but I also think it becomes a part of how we connect with each other, love each other, and know each other as significant beings in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I just had another thought, too, that when you're um, in conversation with a person I I in front of them, you're activating or using all of your senses where your sense of smell your sense of touch your sight your hearing whereas um when you're using 
you know, just email or, or messaging or whatever, you're not, you're not able to utilize all of those senses. And I wonder what a difference that makes. Yeah, we, we talk about it in, in communication as a, as a multi-channeled or single-channeled medium, right? So mm-hmm. the idea is when you're live in living color in the flesh, you're open to all the channels of communication, right? Sight, sound, um, all those all those different rich experiences that are happening in the body, in the in moments of presence. Mm-hmm. And that is a very multi-channeled uh, experience. It's very rich in data. When you're communicating via email or via text, a lot of that data, a lot of that richness is gone by, by definition, mm-hmm. by the very nature of the channel that you're communicating with. Um, you know, texting is great. And I think it's a great way to exchange messages very rapidly, but it's also very limited because I can't see the person. I don't know how they're interpreting it. I don't know if they got it. Um, I don't, I don't know a lot of things um, that I would know if I was seeing them face to face, you know, during an interaction. Mm -hmm. Well, and I just had another thought if someone is say they're, they're sad, they're grieving or, um, you know, you don't have the opportunity to touch them. You don't have the opportunity to give them a hug, to, you know, to look into their eyes and smile. Um, It's just, it's totally different than if you're trying to be supportive through an email or, you know, writing of some sort. It's very difficult to interpret nonverbal cues, right, of sadness, of grief, of loss, uh, for me, I find it very, very difficult to interpret where people are emotionally and psychologically just via text. I have no idea, um, really. Uh, I have, I've had to almost learn when somebody's expressing an emotion via emojis or via via certain words or exclamation points or capitalization. I I find it very difficult to decipher their emotional experience, but when I'm with them, when I'm experiencing someone, you know, live in an embodied moment face to face, I find it so much easier to see where they're at, to see what their mood is, to see if they are upset or angry or happy, because I feel it, right? I feel a, um, a almost like a parallel sensation of where they are in in a moment of kind of empathy or or solidarity. And I think that that is where the the solidarity dimension comes in, at least one of the ways that I think it's very important is being there present with somebody and kind of noticing where they're at and being able to be in sync with the experience of the other and be able to, if they need it, to, to support them, to say, hey, I'm with you. I care about you. I just notice I'm noticing that that it seems to me that you're very upset. Do you need something? Can I support you? Can I give you a hug? All those things are so rich and beautiful and they manifest themselves much more readily, much more easily face to face. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And I found, too, that like on the days when I've got a lot to do around the house, around the property, and I don't really get out, um, that if I just go to the post office, <laughs> you know, and, and talk to the talk to the, one of the people in the post office and have a little chat, just that interaction makes me feel so much better. Exactly right, right. So notice, notice, and you're, you know, speaking to something that's very beautiful and at the same time, very simple. It's just, and in a simple interaction with another human being where you connect and you talk and they validate your existence, you validate theirs, and you feel seen, you feel heard, you feel noticed around your essential humanity. And that becomes very nourishing. For me, that's what I call the experience of solidarity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to cultivate those and to cultivate those, you know, organically 
uh, in the moments of life, right? So in in the talk, I I kind of share the idea of letting somebody else know that they're not alone, that they have value, that they are here with you for a reason beyond all understanding. And and that's that's the point, right? People these days are feeling alone and feeling isolated and feeling uh, depressed or feeling marginalized because many ways, you know, through technology and just through the fast pace of life, we don't have as many moments of connection. So we have to then create a conscious choice to invent, to create moments of connection where you go out and say, hey, I'm going to have a conversation with somebody. I'm going to reach out to somebody. I'm going to ask myself those three questions that I talk about in the TED Talk. You know, who am I in this scene? What is my purpose? And what can I do to be helpful? What can I do to move in the world in ways that work? And then allow those questions to drive your intention. And I've discovered that when you do that, you're much more likely to communicate in ways that are helpful, useful, kind, validate the other person, and in so doing, validate your own experience as a human being that matters, as a human being that is worthy, as a human being that can cultivate moments of solidarity with other people. Mm -hmm. Jose, could you go over those three points again? Yeah, Speaking. sure. So I, so I asked, I um I talk about three three important questions uh, that are at the core of my work at at the intersections of identity intentionality and agency. So identity can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but for me, identity is the idea that you play a particular character in every scene of life. You play a particular role. So you might ask yourself, who am I in this scene? What character am I playing? Okay. The second idea is is intentionality. And intentionality is the notion that you have a purpose, that you have a motivation. And here you might ask yourself, you know, what is my purpose? Uh, what's my intention? What's what's my motivation? And the third component is agency, which is essentially the capacity to take action, the capacity to move in the world in ways that work. And here you might ask yourself, what can I do? How can I move in the world in ways that work? So therefore, now we have three questions. One, who am I in this scene? Two, what is my purpose? And three, what can I do? Can and you give an example? Yes, yes, yes. And, okay. and so and so these these ideas help you become more present. Mm -hmm. I've discovered that we tend to be scattered. We tend to be mindless. We tend to, you know, get distracted, you know, given all the things that you and I have been talking about. Uh, so far in our conversation. So these questions become a point of focus. And not just one question, not just two questions, but three questions. And, and I'm going to get to an example in just a minute, but I want to just drive this point home, sure. mm -hmm. that the idea is to facilitate presence through the power of questions. That wonderful idea that, you know, Dr. Taub, our good friend, always says to mm -hmm. live in the mystery of the question, right? Mm -hmm. Who am I in this scene? What is my purpose? And what can I do to help? So in the TED Talk, just to give you an example, uh, I gave, I shared the story of, of Daniel and a little boy that I, uh, he and his family were at a local park and... Um, I saw that that he and his dad were were having some challenges because Daniel wanted this red balloon that he just couldn't have. And he was just a little kid. He was he was, uh, you know, trying to get this red balloon that that he just couldn't have. It was somebody else's. And he was going back and forth with his dad. And you could kind of hear them arguing. And Daniel was saying, I want the red balloon. And his dad was saying, you can't have it. It's not yours. 
and they were going back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> and I said to myself, gosh, you know, somebody, gosh, I, 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 these people need some help. And, and I didn't know what to do. I felt so awkward and I go, God, should I intervene? I was embarrassed. So I just paused and I asked myself those three questions. Who am I in this scene? What is my purpose? And what can I do to help? Mm-hmm. And sure enough, an answer came. At first, it was like a feeling, like in my gut. And then it turned into like, an, like a spontaneous, creative moment. Mm-hmm. And I just turned to Daniel and I asked him, hey, Daniel, what's your favorite color? And he said, red, you know, and he was focusing on that red balloon that he just couldn't have. And I said, come on, Daniel, isn't there some other color that you might like, like a favorite color that, that you can like right now? And he turned to me and he said, green, 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 green. He kind of jumped up and down like a kid. You know, he was about four or five. It was, it was adorable. I almost, I, I almost like lost it right there. I almost started laughing, but I held, you know, I held, I held on. And I said, all right, green. And then his dad came in almost on perfect cue and said, that's right, Daniel, green is your favorite color. (laughs) And and for some reason at that moment, I felt moved to check my side pocket. And I wasn't quite sure what I would find there, but I, I pulled out my wallet and I found a green parking stub a green parking stuff from some place I had parked the day before. Mm-hmm. And I took it out and I showed it to Daniel, making sure that he saw it. And it was like crickets, silence, right? It was, you could hear a pin drop. <laughs> and I took the ticket and I, and I put it in his hands and I said, Daniel, what is not so clear to the many is oh so clear to the few like you. I put it in his hands. He looked up at me and he looked up at his dad. And I said, you know, Daniel, the words red and green can mean different things for you right now. Red means stop and green means go. You know that, right? And then his dad came in and he goes, Daniel, yeah, you know, you can use that green ticket to get a green balloon because green means go. And then Daniel just looked up at us with this big eyes, almost like in a slight hypnotic trance. And he said, I can go get the green balloon later, huh? (laughs) We said, yeah, that's right. And at that moment, I felt that Daniel's dad and I, I felt that we were channeling Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? (laughs) You know, it was like, you know, Jedi mind trick. Red Mm -hmm. is not the color of the balloon that you're looking for. (laughs) Right? You know, and for me, that example um, came into being, that whole interaction came into being because I was willing to ask myself those three questions, right? Uh Who who am I in this scene? Uh, What is my purpose? And what can I do to help? And then allow myself the possibility to just enter into a moment of solidarity with two other people and, and seeing how the conversation unfolds. You know, I didn't know how it was going to unfold. I didn't know that I was going to, you know, reach into my pocket and find a green ticket. I just allowed that, I don't know, mojo, that flow, that significance, that moment of, you know, unfolding beauty, for lack of a better word, to manifest in its own way, right? And I think that that, that, that can happen all the time if we allow ourselves to be present, Mm -hmm. to stay in the moment, to just, you know, care about people and really give the gift of ourselves in the process of conversation. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I have a question and I I may be completely off here um, or question observation. So, you know, if I'm wrong, don't hesitate to tell me. It sounds to me from the example that you just gave that those three questions, you really weren't answering them. It was almost more that there were open-ended questions and then you just went for it. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. So it wasn't, it wasn't, um, 
a question and answer like like you would have on an exam, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, at first, that's right. kind of what I thought you were saying. But now I'm seeing yeah. it as more like open-ended questions to just get your your out of your way and, and just allow a flow to happen. And yeah. Correct. Correct. Uh, that's a great way of saying it. Allowing a flow to happen, right? Allowing presence to be allowing uh connection to happen right yeah so i mean uh if you think about it when we ask a question it you know that process gets um gets triggered rather organically right when you say hey i wonder what it might be like to do this have you ever thought about that are you planning to you know go to dinner today and somebody just asks a question it generally takes you on a little bit of a search a little bit of a of a journey right mm -hmm. and it, the more that you're open to that journey the more uh, you know spontaneous the response is going to be so it isn't necessarily pre-manufactured or pre-ordained in any way but it allows the the spontaneous exchange of messages, the, the spontaneous exchange of ideas, so that I am no longer this fixed self. Mm -hmm. I become a fluid self. Um, I'm going to get a little heady here for just a moment, so just bear with me. Okay. There's a very famous philosopher, and his name is Emmanuel Levinas, okay. and he talked about the ethical self. And he argued that the ethical self arises in the moment with other people. All right. And that's the idea I'm talking of. That's the idea that I am attempting to convey. The idea that we come into being through our interactions with each other. And the more that we allow that to happen, the more that we experience true freedom, because we're not fixed in a rigid identity that we always perform. Mm -hmm. Instead, we are allowing ourselves to be playful, to be guided, to allow the whatever, the moment, the circumstances, the ideas, the exchange of the moment to not ne not necessarily dictate, but to inform, to induce, to facilitate, to cultivate a sense of solidarity, a sense of community with somebody else. Hmm. That sounds very important to me. And I was going, I was going to ask you to repeat the, the first part, but now that I, I don't know if you can now after kind of flesh it you fleshed it out so yes 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 yeah 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 so i mean uh we're talking what we're talking about here is something extremely profound that you just hit on you nailed it you got it you go okay wait a minute that sounds really important exactly <laughs> right we're talking about having a connection with another person by being open to the presence of the moment mm -hmm. and allowing that to happen through a series of questions, right? So basically we're doing a Jedi mind trick on ourselves mm -hmm. to get out of our own way and allow ourselves to experience the joy of being a human being with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm, I like that. Oh, I like yeah. That. I mean, you know, I think that many times that's what we're looking for when people are feeling lonely, when people are feeling disenfranchised, when people are feeling alone. It's because they're hungry. They're thirsting for moments of connection, moments of significance with somebody else. They are looking for someone to see them to notice them, to say, hey, I see you. Mm -hmm. I, I notice you. I'm here with you. And I am 
connecting with you in this moment through conversation. I'm looking into your eyes. I'm letting you know that I'm here. And that can just be life-saving. I'll, I'll share a quick story. I, I had a conversation with a, with a colleague uh, last semester, and uh, they were you know, having a, a conversation with a, a series of students. And there was a, a student who was having a, a really hard time and uh, this student was, uh, you know, considering, you know, taking their own life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my colleague uh, took a moment to have a heartfelt conversation with the student. Mm -hmm. And the student decided in that moment that life was worth living. Mm -hmm. The student decided to go get help and then reported back to my colleague that 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 was a life changing conversation mm -hmm. and i would argue that those profound moments i mean just take that in for a moment those profound moments of literally saving a life happen through the power of solidarity, through the power of human connection, through the power of, of being present, truly present with somebody and saying, listen, I care about you. I don't know exactly what you're going through. I may not be able to imagine, but I know this. I am here with you. And right now I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling a whole host of things. And I don't know if that's exactly what you're feeling, but I'm here. Is that pretty close? Is that about right? And usually people will say, yeah, you know, that sounds about right. You know, that, that, yeah, thank you for saying that. Or my God, nobody has ever said that to me. Or, oh my God, thank you for saying that. Or, oh my God, thank you for being here with me. Or, oh my God, I just, I just needed you to say that, or I needed somebody to acknowledge me, or they'll just start crying mm, mm -hmm, and have a moment mm -hmm. of heartfelt emotion because somebody else noticed them. Somebody else took a, took a moment, took, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 minutes to just have a simple conversation of acknowledgement of validation. And literally that, that can be enough to, turn a life around and i've seen it over and over again and that was at the core of my motivation for sharing that message is that we don't realize how how much power we can have through conversation to make a difference in the lives of others mm -hmm. absolutely i I, I think this is probably the most important part of this conversation. And, you know, it, and I've said this before on, on other podcast conversations, but one of the things that I really enjoy doing, and, and I know that it can make a huge difference in a person's day is just walking down the street, making the effort to make eye contact with someone and smiling at them. Exactly. Not acknowledging, um, saying, hey, I notice you. Uh, hey, I see you. Right. That that line. Right. And it's a line. Right. It, it, these are just words, but it's the experience that that's pointing to. You know, you know I see you. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You are visible to me. I see you. Right. Namaste. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That idea of I see the divine in you and i see you seeing the divine in me we are acknowledging each other's light right we are acknowledging each other's presence or however you want to say it right mm -hmm. it's that experience of of connectedness of connectedness of uh knowing that somebody else is seeing you and you feel witnessed as if for the first time Yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, if you don't feel comfortable conversing, maybe you're shy or you just don't, just really just a genuine smile 
can make such a difference to and to to look I it's funny I always I try to like somebody maybe looking down or looking kind of sad and and I'll do my best when they look up to catch their gaze you know so that I can look them in the eye and just give them a genuine smile right looking looking at them in the eye giving a, a genuine smile acknowledging their presence having a moment of of connection, a moment of com of communion that becomes really, really important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think in this day and age, this is a very important conversation, and hopefully, it will inspire some of our listeners to really make more of an effort to connect with people. Maybe just go to the coffee shop, just uh, go to the grocery store, and say something to the person in line at the at the cash register or you know have a little chat with the cashier or your meat person or your produce person or you know whatever whatever it takes to create a connection whatever it takes i was on twitter the other day and and i had that very that that exact uh, motivation. And I actually said something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. I said, Hey, just go out. Here's a novel thought. Just go have a conversation with somebody. Go call them. Oh my gosh. Leave a voicemail for someone, right? Yeah. Old school and say, Hey, I was thinking about you. You've been on my mind all day. I love you. Boom. You know? Awesome. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, I mean, unless you have something more to add, that sounds like a, a great finish <laughs> to our conversation. Right. right. Exactly. Right. It's, it's such a simple message. And we say, gosh, that doesn't sound like so profound, but it is profound because we're taking a moment to acknowledge somebody else and to do something that more and more is becoming rather unusual. And, and that is having a conversation letting somebody know that they're cared for, that they're longed for, that they matter, saying that I love you, I'm with you, and, you know, I wish you the best. Let's connect. Let's talk. Let's stay together. That's a great, great message. Mm -hmm. and, and if you doubt the power of that, just think about how would you feel if somebody left you a loving message on your phone that uh, somebody that you knew uh, or cared about and they left you a loving message. How would you feel? Hey, well, my gosh, of course, of course. I mean, imagine, you know, these days we usually text, we usually email, we send some type of a message, again, via a mediated means. But when was the last time that somebody left you a recorded voicemail on your phone and you listened to that message and they said, something beautiful where they they shared a poem or they shared how much they cared about you or they shared what significance you had in their day and they just say hey listen i'm just calling i had a moment uh you came into my mind and i wanted to share this beautiful experience with you before it went i wanted to tell you that i love you you are such a significant person in my life. I can't imagine my life without you. Thank you for being in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting all misty. <laughs> I can tell. I know. I, I mean, you're making me think of uh, when my mom was alive. I used to call her all the time with, you know, little things about something that came up or something I was doing. And even now it's, well, I guess it's five years now. I, I sometimes something will come up and I'll go, Oh, I should tell mom. Or, you know, or, Oh, I need to tell mom this. And I'm like, uh, can't, you know? Yeah. So, right. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, right. Right. Exactly. And honoring those people that are in our lives when they're here, when they can listen to those messages. Sometimes I'll, I'll write like a poem or I'll write a message, um, you know, to someone that I care about and, you know, I'll just, I'll just give it to them or I'll, you know, uh, I will follow my own advice and, uh, you know, leave a message. And I got a phone ringing here. Sorry. Uh, we might need to kind of cut this out. Um, and then, um, you know, people usually are either blown away 
they don't know quite what to say or they say, oh my gosh, thank you. That made my day or, oh my gosh, that is amazing. I, I haven't heard something that beautiful or that authentic in a long time. And that's a beautiful feeling. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can look at it, just struck me, <clears throat> excuse me. You can look at it as an act of kindness. So everybody go out and do, I used to say an, one act of kindness today. I'm going to say, go out and do two acts of kindness today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Uh, let's, let's make it three, right? Three, exactly. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like spread the love. Exactly. You know, create a conversation. Ask yourself, who am I in this scene? What is my purpose? And what can I do to be helpful? And allow the answers to build moments of, of, of solidarity with somebody else, moments of kindness, and hopefully the person who receives that will then share that kindness with other people and we can make the world a better place one conversation at a time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jose. This has been really a lot of fun and very informational too. Great. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was awesome to have this conversation with you. Thank you for partnering with me in the moment of solidarity. Oh, thank you. This has been really fun. And I really enjoyed having you on the podcast again. Thank you. All right. Big hug. Thank you. Big hug back. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you for listening. And thank you, Dr. Jose Rodriguez. I want to say it in Spanish like Dr. Jose Rodriguez for taking time to share your TED Talk with us. The podcast website is realjanine.com where you can listen to and download episodes. You can sign up for the podcast bi-weekly blog newsletter and keep up on new episodes, archives, life updates, and healthy recipes. And remember, once again, Janine is J-A-N-E-A-N. You must have that drilled into you by now. To subscribe to Keeping It Real with Janine, go to iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. If you prefer to listen on YouTube, just type in Real Janine and my channel will show up. And please help out and subscribe. Do you know someone who would benefit from my conversation with Dr. Rodriguez? Of course you do. I know you do. Please share the love. Thanks for listening. Take care. and.